Thank you for joining us today for our Facebook Live session, Treating Anaphylaxis with Epinephrine Auto-Injectors and Common Mistakes to Avoid. I am Ranjit Dangel, VP of Education and Engagement at Food Allergy Canada, and our guest speaker today is Dr. Julia Upton. It is Food Allergy Awareness Month, and this session is a part of our Know It, Treat It campaign to empower all Canadians and take the fear out of anaphylaxis. I'll talk more at the end of the session on how you can get involved, including a chance to win 250 bucks. In today's session, Dr. Upton will review the different epinephrine auto injectors in Canada for treating anaphylaxis and do a demonstration on how they're used, helping you learn which ones might be best for you. You'll also gain a better understanding of the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and what common mistakes to avoid when giving epinephrine and managing anaphylaxis. If you have an epinephrine auto-injector training device, have it handy so you can follow along during the demos. If you don't have one, that's totally fine. A training device is not required for today. Before we get started, I wanted to note a few things. The first being that Bosch Health Canada Inc. has initiated a recall of their m auto-injector devices in Canada due to a potential risk that the auto-injector may fail to activate or activate prematurely if dropped. Although m is currently recalled, we will still be reviewing this device today, so you are familiar with it. This session is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis, or treatment. Please talk to your doctor about any concerns or questions you may have regarding your own health or the health of your child. If you have questions at any point during the session, please ask them through the comment box. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And this session is being recorded and will be shared on Facebook and on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards, so you can watch it again and share it with others. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Julie Apton. Dr. Apton is a Canadian allergist who is on staff at the Hospital for Sick Children in the Immunology and Allergy Department. And she is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Dr. Upton is on the board of directors of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, and she is a member of our healthcare advisory board. I'll now share some slides for Dr. Upton to cover on the basics of anaphylaxis and how to treat a reaction. So just uh, bear with me for one second. There we go. So uh, Dr. Upton, let's start with what anaphylaxis is, including the signs and symptoms. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Uh, so today we're going to think about anaphylaxis in simpler terms. And so you may have heard definitions of anaphylaxis today. We're really going to cover it in a more practical way, trying to think about um, the, the action of when do we use the epinephrine auto injector. So anaphylaxis is potentially life-threatening, but that does not automatically mean fatality. And actually, fortunately, fatalities are very, very rare. The most dangerous symptoms are difficulty breathing. So symptoms affecting the chest or the throat or a drop in blood pressure where the person feels dizzy or feels faint or weak, those kinds of symptoms. And then you can see from the pictures, you know, other symptoms can be gastrointestinal. So meaning feeling nausea, vomiting, and then also the skin symptoms of having hives and swelling. The severity of reactions can actually be impacted by lots of different things. And so one of the things that we really like to pay attention to in anybody with asthma, but also in people with asthma or reactive airways and food allergies is to really control the asthma. We want the lungs to be as healthy as possible, the airways to be moving as freely as possible so that if there was to be an accidental exposure, then the lungs are starting in their best position. The other thing is that we think about people that have had a previous severe anaphylactic reaction, and we think of them a little bit uh, more cautiously and carefully. Um, we also think about other types of cofactors. Some of you may be familiar that reactions can worsen if you exercise after eating, or if you have a fever, or if you're ill otherwise. Great. Uh, can you now cover the different types of auto injectors available in Canada? Yes, absolutely. So currently there's, there's three different brands of auto injectors and within them, they each have two different strengths. And so for the 
EpiPen, which many people are familiar with the term, it has a um, 0.15 dose, and it also has a 0.3 dose. So for the 0.15 dose, that's for smaller kids. So it's labeled for 15 to 30 kilo children. But, you know, if you were smaller than that, then there is actually a Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology statement that says we can use these 0.15 auto injectors even for the youngest of children because there's no other there's no other auto injector in Canada. We don't have a smaller one than 0.15. And so it is endorsed by allergists to use that. I would just sort of say less than 30 kilos, uh, but it's correct. You know, the, the labeling is 15 to 30. And then the 0.3 milligram is for 30 kilos or more. For Allerject, it comes in those same strengths and we'll be demonstrating them later. So Allerject also comes in the 0.15 that we use for anybody that's less than 30 kilos, and then the 0.3 for 30 kilos and more. Um, and just before I move to Emirate, I'll also mention that many allergists actually switch the dosing at around 25 kilos. So don't be surprised if your child is 26 or 27 kilos and they've already been prescribed the point for B. And that's because children grow quickly and the dose is so close that um, many allergy societies and allergists around the world typically choose either 22.5 kilos to change the dose or 25 kilos to change the dose. And then for emerald, that comes in also two doses. So this is a little bit different. It comes in a 0.3 milligram dose, again, for the 30 kilos or more. And then it comes in a bigger dose. It comes in the um, 0.5 milligram dose, which is for 60 kilos or more, which you could also use the 0.3, um, the 0.3 milligram dose. So it's a clinical judgment whether, uh, whether your allergist will prescribe the 0.5 for somebody who's 60 kilos and more. And again, some allergists actually will prescribe the 0.5 even for 50 kilos and more, but the labeling is for 60 kilos and more. Right. Um, now let's move on to the location of the injection. Yes. So we always want to inject the uh, epinephrine auto injector in the muscle in the outer mid thigh. And so this is a great picture here. And I think, is this one I show you how or no? No, not just not quite yet. <laughs> Perfect. So you can see that it's the upper outer part of the thigh. And so what I often describe to people is if there's a seam on the pants, you want to be in front of that seam. You don't want to be behind that seam. You don't want to be, you know, sort of sneaking around the back. You want to be much more around the front. Some people, it's actually where their arm kind of naturally falls. Like if you just stand and you look, where does your hand fall? It's often in that perfect position, the upper outer part of the thigh. Okay, great. And are there different body positions? Yes. Yeah, so for, for when you give the epinephrine auto injector, it's ideal to be sitting or lying down. Um, many people prefer sitting if they're, if they feel like they're having trouble breathing. And, and then after you give the epinephrine, it's ideal to, again, be sitting or lying down and, and really ideally to be uh, on your back with your legs raised. Uh, or if you feel sick, or if you're, then, then you can be on your side so that if you were to vomit, then, then you wouldn't aspirate. And um, for some, I think we talk about it a bit later, but for, for in pregnancy, we would be, we would lie on the, the left side. The key thing though, is as much as our just like you to be lying down after giving the epinephrine auto injector, or even when giving the epinephrine auto injector, the important thing is not to move quickly up. We don't want somebody moving from sitting to standing quickly or from lying to sitting quickly or from lying to standing quickly. Because if you are having any uh, difficulty with your blood pressure, then that will really uh, draw out that problem and make it worse. And, and people have fainted or, or had uh, you know a, a worsening of the reaction with a rapid change in their, um, it, from lying to sitting or sitting to standing. So and then ideally when, um, you know, if 911 has been called, we would really prefer that you don't walk to the ambulance. Uh, the paramedics really should be directed to the person that's experiencing the anaphylaxis. Perfect. 
Yeah, next, can you walk us through what to do uh, during an anaphylactic reaction? Great, yes. So this visual is great that the, the step one is to give the epinephrine auto injector. And really, you want to give that right away. I know many people often think about antihistamines first, but epinephrine is the medication that gets in the quickest, that has the ability to change those signs and symptoms that we showed at the beginning. If the airways are tight, the epinephrine can open the airways. If the blood pressure is low, the epinephrine can raise the blood pressure. So we really want epi in as soon as possible in an anaphylactic reaction. Um, currently, the the recommendation is to call 911 or your local emergency services immediately and tell them that you know you or a child is having an anaphylactic reaction. If the reaction is continuing, then you would want to use a second auto injector as early as five minutes after giving the first dose. If there's no improvement in symptoms or if the symptoms are coming back, and then step four is to go to the nearest hospital right away. Ideally by ambulance, even if they, the symptoms are going away, because it can come back. And uh, and then step five is to make sure that, you know, someone knows you're there. So either the emergency contact or, or a parent or whoever is your, your go-to person. But we want to highlight that it's the allergic reaction that is sending you to the emergency room, not the use of the epinephrine. What I mean by that is sometimes we hear from people, they say, well, I was having a really significant reaction, but I didn't want to give epi because I didn't want to go to the emergency room. But it's the reaction that we want the medical attention for, not the epinephrine, if that makes sense. We want you to treat the reaction and then the idea is that that reaction continues to need treatment. In some people, the epinephrine is a temporizing measure. Now, we will mention here, and we have it on the slide, thank you for that, that there is upcoming more personalized advice that's, that is, it started during the COVID-19 pandemic where, uh, you know, we really started to think more about does every single person need to go to the emergency department if the epinephrine has resolved the reaction very quickly. And so they're really, I, we just kind of want to give a heads up that there is upcoming advice for patients on the need to go to the emergency room post reaction. And in the future, it will be more tailored and, and more you know, sort of patient centered. But right now, I think this is an important slide. And I think generally you can't go wrong with this. It's just a question of, I think some people uh, may be told by their allergist that they could that they could manage at home within certain parameters. That's great. Um, before moving on, I just, we just had somebody ask um, more information about the MRA recall. So I mentioned a little bit at the beginning, but um, you can go to mra.ca and they have everything posted there uh, for more details on the recall. Um, and again, thank you for the info on the five emergency steps. We do have these steps in a brand new uh, sheet along with the body positions available on our site. So you can print them off there and post them as well. Um, so the last uh, slide will really talk through the common mistakes um, people make when giving epinephrine or managing anaphylaxis. So let's start with when giving epinephrine. Um, what are some common mistakes to avoid? Great. Well, I think probably the first and biggest mistake is not giving it, right? So we definitely want to give it. And then, uh, you know, when in doubt, just give it is what we often say. But once you've decided to give it, one of the, the, um, the mistakes that people can make is not holding the device in place for long enough. It actually injects very, very quickly, but people's perception of time when they're worried or panicked can actually be um, a little bit different than, than the time. So it is a good idea to just, you know, count to five or, or some way that you know that you've given it uh, those few seconds to inject. Another thing is not placing the needle uh, the needle end of the device onto the thigh. And we'll show you when we do the demonstrations, but some people end up with the device the wrong way around and uh, and they can end up accidentally injecting their thumb or just not injecting at all. Some people have an overly forceful motion to inject the device. And you know, many people have actually been taught swing and hit it into your leg. You know, we when when and I'll show you when I demonstrate, I usually pick the landmark, like pick where you're going to do it and then push. And, um, and that way I, I know exactly where I'm giving it. 
Uh, we talked a little bit about injecting the wrong body part, and that's often from, from holding the device um, the you know, turned around backwards. And we want to follow device-specific instructions. Uh, and again, I'll show you when I when I demonstrate them, but for example, removing a cap, you know, straight and cleanly uh, it is important when you're using EpiPen, for example. Another thing that can happen is we can make a mistake in, you know, not giving it because we think that a person is experiencing a different kind of reaction. Somebody with asthma, it can be very hard for somebody with asthma to, to figure out, are they actually having an asthma attack or are they having, or is this the beginning of anaphylaxis? Typically there is, you know, typically there are more signs and symptoms than, than just one isolated chest symptom. But again, we usually say when in doubt, just give the epinephrine. Um, and I think those are the main ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, uh, as well, just again, you've already reiterated that it's first line treatment for anaphylaxis and then uh, antihistamines. So not uh, not using antihistamines like Benadryl to, to treat. Yeah, and maybe we'll just pick up on that a little bit that, you know, one of the reasons the antihistamines are not recommended to be first is because of the timing of action. So we can imagine if if I take an oral medication it takes quite a bit of time for that to get to the bloodstream and, and to actually be able to act. So that's part of it. The onset of action is not quick enough to be used in an emergency situation to help with emergency symptoms. And then the other piece though, is a little bit what we talked about earlier, that if my airways are tight, I need them open. And if my blood pressure is low, I need it increased. And the antihistamines just simply don't do that in the same um with the same efficacy and, and with the same strength that epinephrine can do. Okay, perfect. So thanks so much for reviewing these. I know this will be uh, super helpful and it's a perfect segue into, into the demo. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, and if we can now get you to do the demo uh, for each of the devices. So EpiPen, Allergect and Emirate. Uh some people may know once I accidentally injected myself with the real one, so I will always make sure that it is the training device. We can all make mistakes, right? So with the training device and with the real one, the important thing is to have them the right way around. And so EpiPen has that great uh, mnemonic, blue to the sky, orange to the thigh. The blue is the back, the orange is where the needle will come out. And we want to pull the blue cap straight off the back. So what you don't want to do is use one finger and flick it because you don't want to sort of push it on an angle. You want to just pull it straight off the back. And then we talked about we would landmark. I think I'll just move you back a tiny bit more. So if I'm looking at my leg, I want to be in front of the seam. I want to be in the front part of the thigh upper outer part of the thigh. If you look me at me from the front, it looks there. From here, it looks here. I can actually pick that spot to see nothing has happened until I push. And then you hear the click. And then I would count maybe to three just to make sure. And then to take it out. I think it says to just hold for several seconds, but many people like to count. And then you'll see this orange. If this was the real one, the orange would have covered up the needle. So I would not, I would not have to look at the needle with this device. I would be able to, it would be covered up. And then, you know, you can put this back in its case or you can take it to the pharmacy to, to get rid of it. The, the real one, this is what the real one looks like. I'll just show you, you know, often it comes in this case. They are actually quite easy to tell apart. I'll just put that one back together. So the real one has the window so that you can see whether it's nice and clear and the coloring is different. Also, the trainer device says trainer. So you can see they do look a bit different. Excellent. Put that one away. This one is Allergect. So this is a trainer. You can get these online. You can go to the websites and you can get them online. This one talks, so I will be quiet and let you hear it. This 
container contains no needle or drug. If you are ready to use, pull off red safety guard. If not ready to use, replace. So I'm holding both case. sides and I'm going to just pull straight down. It's outer thigh, then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Injection complete. This trainer may be reused for training purposes. Replace the red safety guard and gray outer case. This trainer may be reused. Great. Right. One thing I like to just mention here is you may be noticing that I'm I'm demonstrating these right on uh, right on my pants, like as if I'm as if I'm injecting straight through the layer of clothing. And, and that's allowed. So we don't we don't need to um, you know expose the skin. We actually can just go straight through the pants like that. Okay, and then here's the last one. So this is Emeraid. This is the demo. This one you're just taking off the front. So let me close it again and show you. I'm just. Taking off the front. Okay, and then it's that front that I would then do in that same place. You heard the little click there, I hope. Okay, so this one, there's no removing of the back. There's no, it's the, it's the front that's coming off. Okay, and then this is the real emery. I picked the 0.5 to show you. And you can see this is the real one. And again, if we were going to use it, we would take the front off. I think that was really helpful just to see um, the devices um, as well. Did you, were you able to show people as well the real Allergect? The real Allergect, very different in color, actually. Thank you for that. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. The other, aller the, sorry, the real one's upside down there from our view. Here. <laughs> the, the other one. There we go. Yeah, now they're both upside down. Now they're both upside down. Okay. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah, so you can easily see which is the trainer since they're different color. Very easily, yes. And then this one won't, I believe this is a used one, um, but the um, this one um, obviously won't say this is a trainer, which is great. But yes, so they're quite clear. They say trainer very differently. This one, the EpiPen doesn't have the window and says trainer. Please get a trainer. You know, I totally agree. You didn't need one today, but please do get one. I think it gives a lot of confidence. I think it's uh, it's very helpful to have used it in a in a setting where where there's no um, you know where you don't need it. So and you can get used to the device. And um, and then these ones, I'll just show you again the two beside each other, the trainer and the real one. And when it's out of its case, the trainer and the real one. So this says, you know, again, they've the the trainer says trainer in very, very large letters. And I'd imagine the real ones are probably heavier than the trainer. They are. The yeah, they definitely are. I agree. But if you only have one, then you wouldn't know which is the heaviest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's true. That's true. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks again so much. That's super, super helpful. I know we talk often around how to use them, but we don't really have a lot of sessions that actually go through a demo of it. Um, we did have quite a few questions that came through registration, um, mm -hmm. some through um, chat as well. So let's get started. Um, the first one is how quickly does an anaphylactic reaction happen? Right, so, you know, usually it's within, you know, minutes. 
to hours. There are rare cases where it can happen a number of hours up to 12 or so after, let's say, an ingestion. But typically, it's really within minutes to low digit hours after an in, after a food ingestion and typically quicker after something like a sting or you know an intravenous drug or or something like that okay um is one device better than another for treating a reaction are they equal in effectiveness that's a great question so they are all exactly the same drug um each one of them is exactly the same drug they have different doses in the sense that the MRA goes up to 0.5, but otherwise every single one of them contains epinephrine. So then it comes down to which one do you like better? Which one are you more likely to carry? Which one are you more likely to use? Uh, and I hear lots of different things. Some people really like the carryability of this device. Some people find that it fits nicely, you know, in inside a, an interior jacket. Um, but then some people say, well, I wouldn't want to hear all that talking if I had to use it in a restaurant. So people are different. And I really like that we have this choice on the market. Some people are so familiar with uh, EpiPen and they they really like the, the simplicity of the device. They're extremely used to it. They already have pouches and, uh, you know, paraphernalia to carry it. They know that grandma's familiar with it, all these kinds of things. And so they really like it. And then, you know, some people like the simplicity of design also of MRAID, as well as the fact that you take the front off instead of the back off. And then also people like that it can come in a higher dose. So, you know, I think that there's a different shape, there's, uh, and there's, you know, a different style for each of these devices. And um, what we hope is that, you know, you find the one that works best for you. I know you mentioned it earlier when we were going through the slides, but can you just reiterate what to give a child who weighs less than 15 kilograms? Oh, yes. So, you know, it's a, it, it's a common question. It's actually one of the most common questions that I get. And I guess if we think about what are the options, the options are, well, I don't have something for, let's pick 10 kilos. I don't have something for 10 kilos, so I won't give it. That's not a great option. There's, well, I don't have a device for 10 kilos, so I will draw up with a needle and syringe having to, you know, figure that out and break an ampule. And that's not, not a viable option for the average person. And, uh, or even to give it in a preloaded syringe is typically not a viable option for the average person. The auto injectors were made for a reason to really try to facilitate a lay person to be able to give an, uh, an IM injection. And so then you're left with, okay, well, what if I use the 0.15 dose? And it is a little bit more than we would calculate per kilo of what we would want to give. But having said that, it's not that much more. And, um, and when we look at the risk benefits of giving it versus not giving it and the errors that could happen if we give it any other way, we recommend that we use the, the you know, if it's EpiPen, then it would be the EpiPen Junior. If it's Allerject, it would be Allerject Junior for the, you know, any kid less than 30 kilos. Okay. Uh, perfect. Um, and you mean like less than 15 kilos, less um, than 15, sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. We still, um, although we did talk briefly about how using epinephrine for first line treatment, but, all, but sorry, also less than 30 kilos. Yes. But yes. yes, yes. In, in reference to your question, less than 15. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, so we get a ton of questions about Benadryl or antihistamines in general. People uh, don't know if a reaction is serious enough to use epinephrine or when they should use um, antihistamines. So can Benadryl be used to treat anaphylaxis? Can it be given first and then monitor the reaction before treating with epinephrine? Or are there other antihistamines that can be used? Um, should they be given at the same time as epi? So all those questions wrapped around antihistamine. So if you can cover that. I mean, you know, it's a it's a great question. And I think it stems from the fear of an intramuscular injection, honestly. So it makes a lot of sense that people are, are looking for an oral medication to use initially. 
And one of the ways that I think about it is the antihistamines are great for comfort. So it's we I, I often give antihistamines for somebody who's itchy or somebody who has hives, and I'm giving it for comfort. When I give an antihistamine, I'm not in my mind thinking that I'm helping them for the symptoms I'm most worried about. I'm not giving it for breathing and I'm not giving it for blood pressure. So maybe that's one way to think of it. If there is any concern whatsoever about breathing or blood pressure, then we need to give epinephrine. And so when do we become concerned about breathing or blood pressure? So of course, if, if you can actually see breathing or blood pressure issues, um, meaning that you look like you're having difficulty breathing either because of a throat symptom or a chest symptom, or if um, from a blood pressure point of view, you seem faint or you have a really rapid heart rate. These would be signs to give the epi. But then also there's kind of signs like if there's multiple systems involved, then we become worried that we have this systemic reaction that could progress to breathing or blood pressure in which, again, we give the epinephrine. And so that's why we, we often sort of quickly summarize as one severe or two systems. And, uh, and that's when we would give it. And no, if you, if there's any concern about life-threatening symptoms, then the antihistamines are not that's that's not what they're going to help you with in a timely fashion. That's that's perfect. Um, and what about uh, if it wasn't anaphylaxis and an auto injector was used to give epinephrine? Is that okay? Are there uh, issues, side effects? So it it is. I mean, there's there's never a contraindication to epinephrine during an anaphylactic reaction. So that's that's for sure. Certainly, we don't want you know to just use it in the morning. I'll have a coffee and a shot of epinephrine. I'm being a bit silly, but, but the, if, you know, if you thought it was indicated and you thought it was reasonable, then it's reasonable to give. I mean, it's, it's really as simple as that. If you're not sure, we'd rather you give it than don't give it. And, um, you know, the, the, the side effects of, of epinephrine during an allergic reaction that, you know, it, whether you exactly needed it or not, you'd just be better, you'd be better to give it. And as I kind of hinted through this, uh, one time when I was demonstrating an epinephrine <laughs> auto ejector device, I did actually use the wrong one, which I just like to tell people because, uh, you know, it, it all that happened was I had a little red dot because I did do it in the right place. So that's <laughs> good. So I had, I had a little red dot, you know, here on my leg. Um, and of course, massive embarrassment because it wasn't deliberate, but other than that, I was perfectly fine. And, um, so of course that's an N of one, but I just hope that it, I, I tell the story because I think it's, it's helpful for people to know that I, I do know what it feels like. I barely noticed it. And, um, and that I certainly didn't need it in the slightest and, and I was fine. So please, I try to. I try to help people think of these in a different way. Sometimes I say, you know, if you were having an allergic reaction and you were surrounded by a hundred emergency room physicians or hundred emergency department physicians and 300 allergists and, you know, 20 anesthetists, you know, take, take your pick of your favorite type of doctor, what would they do? They, they would give you this, you know, and you have this in your pocket or your pouch or your backpack. And so I, I try to hope to make them a little bit more friendly and have them feel like they're on, they're on your side rather than um, just thinking about the needle. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And I, I do like it when I've, I've uh, heard you say that before. And I think it's super important when you say that you've got the best tool right in your hands. Uh, rather than waiting for emergency or, or the, the doctors to use it. Um, yeah, there's few areas in medicine where we have the best treatment at mm -hmm. at home, you know, and, and mm -hmm. available to us. And um, so, you know, I think, I think it is really good to become as familiar as you can with them so that when you need them, they're, you know, they're a friendly face. <laughs> yeah. I know people who practice even with their expired devices and in uh, pumpkins or other other things they'll inject it into a peach or a fruit just to get the feeling of it um feeling of it as well 
We had a Absolutely. question come in about um, should you mis massage the injection 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 site um, after giving up an Ephraim? Like, do you need to do anything? You just give it and release, or uh, does massaging help? So that's a great idea. It is, it is thought that massage might make the absorption quicker, and mm -hmm. so some of the devices actually mention right on it to um to to massage but they don't they don't routinely say it so um i personally i usually do um but uh it's not sometimes when you're overwhelmed with too many steps it can be overwhelming so the most important thing is do it yeah. and then <laughs> you know if 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 you're of sound mind and body and you can also massage them, then that's great. But I think the priority is to get it in. And if you didn't remember to massage, then don't beat yourself up over it. But yes, I think there is there is a thought that it would help to absorb it quicker. But I don't have, you know, multiple trials to show you that that's the truth. It's more that it it would make sense that it would help to absorb it quicker. Okay. And then we've had a few questions about expired devices. So um, one being, can I use an expired device if I don't have any other options? So if you only have an expired device, then you would be better to use it than not use it. Uh, the, this one, for example, has the window where you can actually see whether it's cloudy, whether, whether it looks okay, whether the color is okay. Um, and just looking if this one does too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but you'd be better to use it than not use it. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, and some studies have been done that actually show that it lasts beyond the expiration date. I will say that since those studies, many of the companies extended their expiration dates. So we do want to just be a bit cautious about how long we use them mm -hmm. afterwards, uh, because they, the companies extended the dates. But certainly, if all you have is an expired device, use it. Uh, and then, you know, do try to get a new, uh, a new one when you can. Then what should you do with an expired epinephrine auto injector or one that you've, you've used? Do you just throw it in the garbage? Like, how do you dispose of it? Yeah, so they have a needle. So usually people would want you to bring it back to the, um, to the pharmacy. Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, how do you know when you may need to give a second dose? of epinephrine and when should you give it? Should it be in the same leg? Are there any other things to think about uh, when giving a second dose? Yeah, so if you, uh, usually what we recommend is that if you haven't seen symptom improvement or if the symptoms are coming back five minutes after you gave the first dose, then to give another dose. Uh, it's a great question. Do you do the same leg or not? I mean, in there, there isn't really a lot of advice around that. I think it makes sense that you could give it in the other leg and it may actually improve absorption. Cause if we sort of think of what's going on in the first leg, it, the, um, the, the, the vessels could be a bit constricted and in theory it could reduce the absorption. Uh, but again, it's not something I'd worry about if, if I'm right-handed and I know I'm going to be able to do it better on my right leg, then that's what I'm going to do. And I'm actually very, very bad with my left hand. So I actually think personally, I would just give it again in, you know, a slightly bit lower uh, in the same leg that I did it. Okay. So, okay. um, yeah. And how many doses of epinephrine can be given? How many is, is there such thing as too many doses of epinephrine? So for lay people, we would usually say that, you know, two. I mean, you usually we we write our prescriptions as as you know, give it, and then you can repeat in five minutes. Um, but uh, certainly in a medical setting, we can give more than that, and then we can also switch to intravenous delivery in a medical setting. So um, I think, I mean, if if I was at a cottage or if I was having a significant reaction, I I would give a third. Um, if you have that, but many people only have two devices on hand and I don't want to give the impression that it's common that you need a, a third. I mean, often you have a, a significant, um, uh, result to even the first one and then the second one, if you need that, and often that would be an, enough of a temporizing measure until emergency services come and then, and then your, and then your management is being directed by healthcare professionals. Okay. Perfect.
And I know you mentioned this before when we were on the slides talking about body positions, but uh, can you, uh, we had a question come in about, is it true that it's very important not to abruptly move someone during it is and why? It is. Mm -hmm. it is. So, so we're not very good in allergy about predicting how severe things will be. I'm sure many people in this audience know that we're not great at that, but some of the things we do know as risk factors for poor outcomes in anaphylaxis, one is a rapid change in position. Another one is poorly controlled asthma. So these are two things that we like to control as much as we can. And we really don't want someone quickly moving from lying down to sitting up or sitting up to standing. Okay. And then do allergic reactions get increasingly worse or more severe each time you have a reaction? I know that's something we get asked quite often. Right. So the answer is no. And um, uh, I think we're, it, it's, it's no with an asterisk in a way, because I think where some of that comes from is, uh, you know, that the reactions can be for some people unpredictable in the sense that uh, there are many things that are unpredictable. You can imagine that if one time I have a reaction to peanut because of accidental exposure, and then another time I actually take a bite of something that truly contains peanut um, in a large amount, you might expect that I would have a different reaction because I ate a significantly different amount. Another thing could be that maybe one time I had um, an exposure when I was sick and another time I wasn't sick. So it can be hard to predict the reaction and some people can have varying severities from their same allergic reaction. But we know from the field of desensitization, uh, things like oral immunotherapy, for example, that if we give the same food enough times over a long period of time, we can actually decrease in many people the severity of the reactions uh, and increase the amount of food that it takes for them to react. On the other hand, we do see people who, for example, receive repeated intravenous uh, drugs that become allergic to those, and then and they the immune system gets stimulated. So I think what I'm saying overall is that the immune system reacts to many, many different um, features. It reacts to the root that it saw the allergen, whether it was oral, whether it was intravenous, it reacts to the amount, it reacts to how was the person when they had that exposure. And so all of these things may, can make it the, the severity difficult to predict and leave people with that impression. But the short answer is it doesn't get worse each time. Okay, great. Um, we did have a question just come up. Um, are there any contraindications, precautions with people with high blood pressure atrial fibrillation or cardiovascular illness with um, with epinephrine? Yeah, so there's there's no contraindication to epinephrine during an anaphylactic reaction. So even people with cardiac disease as described, for example, if they were stung by a bee and had anaphylaxis, you would still give them epinephrine. So n the, the short answer is no. Okay. Um, and then we did have a question come in about if you're pregnant. So how should you administer the device should they be laying down, um, for instance? Yes, in an ideal world, they would be lying, laying down and on their left side. Okay. Um, okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, if there's still any questions, I'm still gonna, we're still on for a little bit further. Um, so please do pop any questions in chat if there's any extras. Uh, I know we've covered a ton of information. Um, we can find additional resources on our website at foodallergycanada.ca. So as I mentioned, it is Food Allergy Awareness Month this month, and we're focusing on anaphylaxis education by doing sessions like the one we did today. We've relaunched our Know What Treat It campaign, which is about empowering all Canadians to recognize and treat anaphylaxis through real life stories and experiences. Um, so you can go on our site, see a gallery of how people un un knew it was anaphylaxis and how they treated it. You can participate in the campaign by sharing your story and you can get a chance to win $250 um, through that. So find out more at uh, foodallergycanada.ca slash fam, that's F-A-A-M. We also have a whole host of new resources, like uh, new videos explaining food allergy and anaphylaxis and particularly what kind of happens to your body, um, uh, why epinephrine is important, but more with a science lens uh, through it with Dr. Philippe Beja. 
We have, I mentioned before, the five emergency steps that we reviewed earlier. We have that in a sheet with body positions and a new epinephrine sheet that also goes through the different devices that Dr. Upton had walked through. Um, and then a bunch of other tips. So I uh, recommend going on our site, checking them out. We also have launched uh, just this week, a new audio series called Listen and Learn. The first session is on needle-free epinephrine options with Dr. Harold Kim. So you can take a listen to that on our site. Um, it's posted in our recorded webinars and events page. And then if you want to test your knowledge on anaphylaxis and uh, what to do, you can take a free allergyware.ca course. It's a 30-minute online course, and it covers the basis, basis, basics of anaphylaxis and ways to reduce risks and recommended emergency treatment. So you can test yourself on your knowledge and recommend it to others as well. It's a, a really great course. And then as Dr. Upton mentioned, please don't forget to order free training devices as well. Mm. So, um, practice, practice, practice. So Dr. Upton, mm. um, as I mentioned, we covered a ton in this session. Can you summarize top points you wanna make sure people take away? Yes, absolutely. So I think, you know, if I had to pick maybe four points, I would say if you're unsure about a reaction, the safe choice is to use the epinephrine auto injector. The earlier that you give the epinephrine, the better the outcomes are. And so practice with a training device, know how to use it in the case of an emergency. And hopefully this helped, but if you're still uncertain, please tap into the Many Food Allergy um, Canada resources on this subject. Okay, that's an awesome summary. Um, and uh, number one point, as you mentioned, if you're unsure, just to use it. There's no downside to it. Um, so those of you in the audience uh, may be aware that we are a not-for-profit charity. Um, we're completely reliant on donations for the support of the work that we do, like this session. So if you can consider a donation to our organization, we would be so uh, very greatly appreciative of it. You can visit foodallergycanada.ca slash donate to learn more about, um, about that. We'd also like to thank our supporters for this session, uh, the Schroeder Foundation, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, Allergact, the Peanut Bureau of Canada, and EpiPen. I'd also like to mention that we'll be holding a French version of this session with Dr. Philippe Bejan next week on May 23rd, so you can sign up for that on our events page on our site. And um, with that, oh, actually, we had one, one more question pop up, or a few more questions, no, one more question pop up. <laughs> How to manage maintaining the temperature of epinephrine when outdoors in the winter and outside on a very sunny day? Can you recommend, um, what would you recommend? Are there any specific carrying cases or pouches? And I know from our side, we recommend um, keeping it um, inside your coat pocket in the winter and in the summer, not putting it in car dashboards or carrying it um, out where it can get really heated. But I don't know if if you have more recommendations, Dr. Upton. Yeah, I think those are great. I mean, I think um, I, I I totally agree. I think it's it's probably not realistic to think that it wouldn't get heated at all on a hot summer day, especially if you're carrying it in a, you know, if, if a child's carrying it in a carrying pouch. But that's not the same as the dashboard, you know, in the yes. within the car where it can get to an incredible temperature. So I think... I think pat yourselves on the back that you have it with you, <laughs> that it's there. Yeah. And so long as you do your best to avoid extreme temperatures, um, if you keep within the within reason of the expiry date and you've kept it out of extreme temperatures, I probably wouldn't worry about it much. Okay, perfect. Um, well, with that, um, this now concludes our Facebook Live event. I thank you so much, Dr. Upton, for your expertise, um, your insight, and for helping to take the fear out of anaphylaxis. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you for having me.